The Secret Garden by Francis Hodgson Burnett. Chapter Seven. The Key to the Garden. Two days after this, when Mary opened her eyes, she sat upright in bed immediately and called to Martha. Look at the moor! Look at the moor! The rainstorm had ended, and the grey mist and clouds had been swept away in the night by the wind. The wind itself had ceased, and a brilliant deep blue sky arched high over the moorland. Never, never had Mary dreamed of a sky so blue. In India, skies were hot and blazing. This was of a deep, cool blue, which almost seemed to sparkle like the waters of some lovely, bottomless lake. And here and there, high, high in the arched blueness, floated small clouds of snow white fleece. The far reaching world of the moor itself looked softly blue instead of gloomy purple black or awful dreary grey. Aye, said Martha with a cheerful grin, the storm's over for a bit. It does like this at this time of the year. It goes off in a night like it was pretendin' it had never been here and never meant to come again. That's because the springtime's on its way. It's a long way off yet, but it's comin'. I thought perhaps it always rained or looked dark in England, Mary said. Eh, hey, no, said Martha. Sitting up on her heels among her black lead brushes. Now to the sort. What does that mean? asked Mary seriously. In India, the natives spoke different dialects, which only a few people understood, so she was not surprised when Martha used words she did not know. Martha laughed as she had done the first morning. There now, she said. I've talked broad Yorkshire again, like Mrs. Medlock said I mustn't. Now to the sort means nothing of the sort, slowly and carefully. But it takes so long to say it. Yorkshire's the sunniest place on earth when it is sunny. I told thee thou'd like the moor after a bit. Just you wait till you see the gold colored gorse blossoms, and the blossoms o' the broom, and the heather flowerin', all purple bells. And hundreds o' butterflies flutterin', and bees hummin', and skylarks soarin' up and singin'. You'll want to get out on it at sunrise, and live out on it all day like Dickon does. Could I ever get there? asked Mary wistfully, looking through her window at the far off blue. It was so new and big and wonderful, and such a heavenly colour. I don't know, answered Martha. Thou's never used the legs since thou was born, it seems to me. Thou couldn't walk five mile. It's five mile to our cottage. I should like to see your cottage. Martha stared at her a moment curiously before she took up her polishing brush and began to rub the grate again. She was thinking that the small plain face did not look quite as sour at this moment as it had done the first morning she saw it. It looked just a trifle like little Susan Ann's, when she wanted something very much. I'll ask my mother about it, she said. She's one of them that nearly always sees a way to do things. It's my day out today, and I'm going home. Eh, I am glad. Mrs. Medlock thinks a lot of mother. Perhaps she could talk to her. I like your mother, said Mary. I should think they did, agreed Martha, polishing away. I've never seen her, said Mary. No, the hasn't, replied Martha. She sat up on her heels again and rubbed the end of her nose with the back of her hand as if puzzled for a moment. But she ended quite positively. Well, she's that sensible and hard workin' and good natured and clean that no one could help liking her whether they'd seen her or not. When I'm going home to her on my day out, I just jump for joy when I'm crossin' the moor. I like Dickon, added Mary, and I've never seen him. Well, said Martha stoutly, I've told thee that the very birds likes him, and the rabbits, and wild sheep, and ponies, and the foxes themselves. I wonder, staring at her reflectively, what Dickon would think of thee. He wouldn't like me, 
said Mary, in her stiff, cold little way. No one does. Martha looked reflective again. How does thou like thyself? she inquired, really quite as if she were curious to know. Mary hesitated a moment and thought it over. Not at all, really, she answered. But I never thought of that before. Martha grinned a little as if at some homely recollection. Mother said that to me once, she said. She was at her wash tub, and I was in a bad temper and talkin' ill of folk, and she turns round on me and says, The young vixen, the, there the stand, sayin' the doesn't like this one and the doesn't like that one. How does the like thysel? It made me laugh, and it brought me to my senses in a minute. She went away in high spirits as soon as she had given Mary her breakfast. She was going to walk five miles across the moor to the cottage, and she was going to help her mother with the washing and do the week's baking, and enjoy herself thoroughly. Mary felt lonelier than ever when she knew she was no longer in the house. She went out into the garden as quickly as possible, and the first thing she did was to run round and round the fountain flower garden ten times. She counted the times carefully, and when she had finished, she felt in better spirits. The sunshine made the whole place look different. The high, deep blue sky arched over Misselthwaite as well as over the moor, and she kept lifting her face and looking up into it, trying to imagine what it would be like to lie down on one of the little snow white clouds and float about. She went into the first kitchen garden and found Ben Weatherstaff working there with two other gardeners. The change in the weather seemed to have done him good. He spoke to her of his own accord. Springtime's coming, he said. Cannot the smell it? Mary sniffed and thought she could. I smell something nice and fresh and damp, she said. That's the good rich earth. He answered, digging away. It's in a good humour, making ready to grow things. It's glad when plantin' time comes. It's dull in the winter when it's got nout to do. In the flower gardens out there, things will be stirrin' down below in the dark. The sun's warmin' 'em. You'll see bits o' green spikes stickin' out o' the black earth after a bit. What will they be? asked Mary. Crocuses and snowdrops and daffy down dillies. Has they never seen them? No, everything is hot and wet and green after the rains in India, said Mary, and I think things grow up in a night. These won't grow up in a night, said Weatherstaff. They'll have to wait for 'em. They'll poke up a bit higher here and push out a spike more there, and uncurl a leaf this day and another that. You watch 'em. I am going to, answered Mary. Very soon she heard the soft rustling flight of wings again, and she knew at once that the robin had come again. He was very pert and lively, and hopped about so close to her feet, and put his head on one side and looked at her so slyly, that she asked Ben Weatherstaff a question. Do you think he remembers me? she said. Remembers thee? said Weatherstaff indignantly. He knows every cabbage stump in the gardens, let alone the people. He's never seen a little wench here before, and he's bent on finding out all about thee. Does no need to try to hide anything from him. Are things stirring down below in the dark in that garden where he lives? Mary inquired. What garden? grunted Weatherstaff, becoming surly again. The one where the old rose trees are. She could not help asking, because she wanted so much to know. Are all the flowers dead, or do some of them come again in the summer? Are there ever any roses? Ask him, said Ben Weatherstaff, hunching his shoulders toward the robin. He's the only one as knows. No one else has seen inside it for ten year. Ten years was a long time, Mary thought. She had been born ten years ago. She walked away, slowly thinking. She had begun to like the garden, just as she had begun to like the robin, and Dickon, and Martha's mother. She was beginning to like Martha, too. That seemed a good many people to like, when you were not used to liking. 
she thought of the robin as one of the people. She went to her walk outside the long, ivy-covered wall over which she could see the treetops, and the second time she walked up and down the most interesting and exciting thing happened to her, and it was all through Ben Weatherstaff's robin. She heard a chirp and a twitter, and when she looked at the bare flower-bed at her left side there he was, hopping about, and pretending to peck things out of the earth, to persuade her that he had not followed her. But she knew he had followed her, and the surprise so filled her with delight that she almost trembled a little. "'You do remember me!' she cried out. "'You do! You are prettier than anything else in the world!' She chirped and talked and coaxed, and he hopped and flirted his tail and twittered. It was as if he were talking. His red waistcoat was like satin, and he puffed his tiny breast out and was so fine and so grand and so pretty that it was really as if he were showing her how important and like a human person a robin could be. Mistress Mary forgot that she had ever been contrary in her life when he allowed her to draw closer and closer to him, and bend down and talk and try to make something like robin sounds. Oh, to think that he should actually let her come as near to him as that! He knew nothing in the world would make her put out her hand toward him, or startle him in the least tiniest way. He knew it because he was a real person, only nicer than any other person in the world. She was so happy that she scarcely dared to breathe. The flower-bed was not quite bare. It was bare of flowers, because the perennial plants had been cut down for their winter rest, but there were tall shrubs and low ones which grew together at the back of the bed, and as the robin hopped about under them she saw him hop over a small pile of freshly turned-up earth. He stopped on it to look for a worm. The earth had been turned up because a dog had been trying to dig up a mole, and he had scratched quite a deep hole. Mary looked at it, not really knowing why the hole was there, and as she looked she saw something almost buried in the newly turned soil. It was something like a ring of rusty iron or brass, and when the robin flew up into a tree nearby she put out her hand and picked the ring up. It was more than a ring, however. It was an old key, which looked as if it had been buried a long time. Mistress Mary stood up and looked at it with an almost frightened face as it hung from her finger. "'Perhaps it has been buried for ten years,' she said in a whisper. "'Perhaps it is the key to the garden.'" End of chapter 7 Read by Kara Schallenberg on January 20th, 2006, in Oceanside, California.